Now the changing etiologies which occurs into this, the changing etiology of acute respiratory failure receiving non-invasive ventilation, mainly we have seen that COPD, it plays a very important role and this was published way back in the annals of thoracic surgery. Second was pulmonary edema, third was pneumonia, fourth was asthma and then neurological and other diseases. So the etiological selection is very important and they play a very important role. If you really want to have a good success with non-invasive and have to reduce the mortality, selection of the patient is very important. Now let's go about non-invasive ventilation for acute exaggeration. Don't think it twice, it's all right. Definitely you have started the patient on non-invasive ventilation. Yes, it uploads the fatigue, it reduces the fatigue, it improves the gas exchange. It is definitely, it offsets the peak because there is certain amount of uh, intrinsic peak which will occur in these COPD patients. And because of this positive pressure, there is also going to be a bronchodilator effect and there is going to be a work of breathing. Yes, it is going to be beneficial in COPD patients to start off with. Of course, you are not supposed to compromise on nebulization, the use of antibiotics, proper other care really needs to be continued. And as I told you, the rationale into these patients is to decrease the CO2 level. And what does it do? There is a bronchospasm, there is an airway mucus plugging and the airway inflammation which is there. And this bronchospasm air trapping which is going to occur and this air trapping can also give rise to dyspnea. And the, along with this, this air trapping with the application of heat and with the application of positive pressure, the elastic recoil and, the, and all those functions, the respiratory mechanics is going to be better. And because of the decreased amount of workload onto the respiratory muscles, definitely the work of breathing is going to go down. And because of the work of breathing is going to go down, as a result of which there is going to be the, 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 the proper respiratory distress will go down and therefore there will be a decreased amount of carbon dioxide uh, which will occur into this. So the population incidences of using intermittent mechanical ventilation and non-invasive mechanical ventilations in acute respiratory failure. This was again published way back. If you really consider the graph here, maximum amount into this group that you can see here that the COPD, non-COPD, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, mechanical ventilation via endotracheal tube, we have found that over a period of time, definitely the chances and definitely better results were seen into the group where non-invasive mechanical ventilation was given into the COPD into the COPD group, and that was much more beneficial. The use of non-invasive ventilation over a period of time has been increasing uh, as we service against non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Even in for COPDs into this, yes, if you see right from 1998 to 2008, over a period of time, we have seen that non-invasive use of non-invasive mechanical ventilation the proportion of patients who are more than that to receive it are much more better. And over a period of time, more and more patients for this have been ventilated with non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Similarly, the changes in the practice of non-invasive ventilation patients in COPD patients over the last eight years. This is a very old slide. I'm sorry, I've not been able to update it. But uh, we have seen that the total percentage of the hospitalized patient with the pH of more than or equal to 72, 7.2 outside the respiratory care unit, over a period of time, more and more patients over a period of time now have been ventilated with non-invasive mechanical ventilation rather than with invasive mechanical ventilation. Yes, non-invasive does have limitations. As I did tell you that once you initiate non-invasive ventilation, you are supposed to monitor it, you are supposed to see it, we are also supposed to see what is the right time to stop it and convert it from invasive to non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Okay. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Here, this was a Cochrane review, and this Cochrane review came way back. And non-invasive ventilation for the treatment of respiratory failure due to acute exaggerations uh, into this. And this Cochrane review, it was suggested that yes, over a period of time. They did a forest plotting of comparison, and this mainly suggested that non invasive mechanical ventilation, the mortality was beneficial in the group or more less in the group where non invasive mechanical ventilation was used. The intubation, the patients requiring intubations, was also that those patients where non invasive mechanical ventilation was started, the requirement of intubation was also less in the group where non invasive mechanical ventilation was started as compared to the group where. Uh, where other patients were compared. Now, the global strategies which were there, 
uh, for the diagnosis, management strategies, and this was there. Non-invasive ventilation in COPD, it improves the respiratory acidosis, decreases the work of breathing, and more importantly, and also reduces the hospital stay, the length of ventilatory associated pneumonia, and also shortens the ICU length of stay, and reduces the chances of incubation as well as the mortality. So this is evidence A. It is proven beyond doubt in COPD patients. Yes, non-invasive ventilation is the key. And the indications of non-invasive mechanical ventilation, we did cover it up in the last uh, series of part one. That is the respiratory acidosis of less than 7.35 and severe dyspnea with clinical signs which are suggestive of acute respiratory muscle fatigue, such as the use of accessory muscles of respiration, paradoxical motion of respiration, and also the retraction of intercostal spaces. And this is the main indication to see okay.